This session we are going to be having now is called Embracing Collaborative Chaos, and I'm delighted to welcome Lindsay Prever on stage. Great, thanks for the introduction, Prem. Hello, my name's Lindsay. Uh, for the last few years, I've been uh, leading a group of platform teams uh, that develop and operate a very large platform as a service for a very large public sector uh, organization based here in the United Kingdom. In this talk, I'm going to be going through how we've used Chaos Days as a, a really useful approach for improving the resilience of our platform uh, and learning more about um, how it handles uh, failures and uh, helping us improve uh, the, the kind of approach to handling failures so that uh, failures can be handled more, more gracefully. Right, let's get my slides up. Let's start off by thinking about what we mean by, by chaos engineering and why it's an important thing uh, to, to spend time on. Chaos engineering is, is really important when you're building um, IT services, particularly IT services that are, are really, really important uh, that for people to be able to access uh, and they take a lot of traffic. It's further compounded when you're trying to do all this at speed. Here in the United Kingdom, uh, our, our government has been providing various services to try and um, help people that have been impacted by coronavirus, by CV-19. The organization I have been uh, kind of working for has been part of building these services. And uh, it's been a very uh, kind of exciting thing to do uh, and a, kind of a real privilege to be part of this. These services um, were only built in about four weeks. Uh, they were delivered um, 10 days early and they they processed one of the services processed 140,000 claims on its on its on its launch day it did all that without any major incidents i think one of the reasons that we were able to achieve this is because uh, as we've evolved the platform that the service is built on we've paid a lot of attention to uh, to understanding um, how to make it more resilient to understand it how it fails and to uh, use chaos engineering to help drive those learnings and improve that resilience. So this, this scheme, this government scheme is just one example of a service that you know, has really benefited from chaos engineering. Let's look at another one um, that is a, a, another good example of why uh, it's important to think about failure. When you're building something uh, like Nest, for instance, um, it's, it's something that's used around the world and it uh, it relies on services that are interconnected around the world. It's very easy now through uh, cloud uh, platforms um, and through things like agile and lean uh, development techniques to, to build something that's planet scale uh, really, really fast. And when you're building it, you're, you're dealing with, with components that are hiding a lot of the complexity from you. But underneath those components uh, have a, a large number of moving parts and a large number of things that are connected, as this diagram shows. Now, you think if you're building something uh, using Google's technology, they've probably got resilience covered. Um, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm not sure if people saw this uh, just over a year ago. Um, there was an issue with uh, one of Google's, uh, I think, one of their networks. And that uh, had a ripple effect. Uh, it combined with various um, other problems uh, and then caused people that use Nest uh, to, to not be able to use some of their, their smart home automation. Uh, people were tweeting that they, they couldn't turn their air conditioning on because uh, their Nest wasn't working because it wasn't communicating with uh, the particular Google service that it relied on. They couldn't, couldn't get into their homes to use if they were using a smart lock. This is a great example of just how when um, several failures can happen to combine in a way that's catastrophic. When I see these uh, incidents happening around the world, I always find it really interesting uh, to read the, the incident report that uh, really good organizations like Google tend to make publicly available soon afterwards. And what fascinated me about this particular incident report was, was how it, it typified um, the importance of chaos engineering in that it wasn't one single issue that caused this problem, but it was actually two normally benign um, issues 
and specific uh, bug. They came together that caused this, this significant outage that had a significant impact. The systems that, that each of us build, unless they're incredibly trivial, will generally fail in some kind of way. Failures are, are often happening in, in small ways uh, the whole time in our systems. It's just that they're not combining in such a way that they cause catastrophic failure. I'd like you to spend a few moments just thinking through uh, a system that you're working on currently um, or you've recently worked on. And work out in your head, what are the different component parts uh, that, that you have control over? How are those component parts connected? Are they all running on the same uh, kind of, um, piece of uh, processor? Or are they spread across uh, network connections? Or are they spread across the world? How reliable each are each of those components? How reliable are the connections between them? What would happen if one component failed or two components failed? What would happen if a component partly failed and there was latency in the connection between the various components? What I'm hoping is that as you're thinking through those things, you're starting to realize that actually the types of systems that we're developing these days have a high number of, of uh, connecting parts uh, that, that make them very complex and very difficult to predict exactly uh, what, what will happen when things fail. And this is where chaos engineering can really help. Unless you're dealing with a, a simple system uh, that is just a very small number of components with a small number of connections, um, don't think many of us are working in that space these days. Most of us are dealing with, with hard systems uh, that have multiple components, multiple connections between them, many subcomponents, uh, and often those subcomponents are things that are hidden from us. Chaos engineering helps us understand these failure modes by uh, deliberately inducing failure into the parts that we want to understand more about, and then observing the impact of that failure, reflecting on, on you know, what it's teaching us about the, the way, way the system behaves under failure, about the way uh, we can observe that failure, and also about how our teams operate when those failures happen. Chaos engineering then helps us to take those lessons and improve the, the resilience of the systems we're working in. It helps us to build resilience into what we're doing. Chaos engineering also helps us uh, to get used to thinking about production the whole time, particularly about what could go wrong in production. Because it's not a question of if uh, or when, if something is going to fail, it's more a question of when is a failure going to occur. Resilience is, gonna, is a word I'm going to use quite a lot in this uh, presentation, so let's just uh, agree on a definition. I took this from um, the kind of online uh, Oxford Dictionary. By resilience, we're focusing on systems that can recover well. We're not talking about systems that uh, are indestructible, systems that will never fail. Because the complexity of our systems these days is, is, is so high that failures are happening the whole time. And it's, it's uh, very almost impossible to achieve systems that will never, ever fail. It's more important that we consider how can we make our systems more resilient? How can we ensure that when failures happen and when they combine in different ways, we can bring a normal kind of operating operation back as quickly as possible. We're trying to design systems that are that are elastic. There's four different ways uh, I've seen of using chaos engineering uh, to help us achieve this. Um, and I'm going to step through a brief overview of them in a minute, uh, and then we'll focus on uh, the kind of the chaos day approach. The fourth one uh, is something that is not a very popular one to talk about, and so I'll get to that in a minute. The manual chaos is where things like chaos days or AWS game days uh, or change specific chaos, where the engineers that are working on the system, they uh, deliberately take time out to uh, interfere with the system and inject chaos in some kind of way and then observe the response learn from it, and then adapt the system as, as, as necessary. This can be done 
um, either on your own system through through your running your own chaos days, or you can learn more about the concepts of chaos engineering or resilience uh, engineering uh, through uh, going to uh, some of the AWS run called a game day, where you get to uh, work as a as an engineer on a system that they've constructed, an artificial system uh, that they start injecting failures to. And that's a really fun thing to do if you've not, uh, not done it before. A change specific chaos is then when teams are looking at um, each significant ch uh, change they're making to the system and trying to, uh, as part of the engineering of that change, to kind of test out different failure modes. By automated chaos, I'm referring to uh, systems and software that you have running kind of either continuously or you run frequently uh, against your system that uh, cause things to fail uh, in an automated way. So things like uh, Netflix's Chaos Monkey. I'd also count the use of uh, cloud technologies such as uh, AWS Spot instances and GCP preemptible VMs. So these are compute instances that um, don't have a, a kind of guaranteed permanent lifetime. They're instances that will uh, be, be terminated at some point. The services running them will receive notice, but by work, using these, these types of compute instances, then you're having to design uh, the services run on them to handle the fact that, that they will be terminated at some point and fairly frequently. And that is one way of, of making your services more resilient. Uh, for instance, when they run on uh, other compute instances that, that fail uh, unexpectedly. Another example of automated chaos is uh, the picture shown in, in the bottom. Uh, we ran a, um, a hackathon a day at this organization. Uh, and one of the teams came up with this great concept of, uh, they took a, um, a Nintendo emulator and they wired up the uh, emulator so that when you're playing Super Mario, if Mario happened to die in the game, then a random Kubernetes pod would be killed. Uh, and that's what you're kind of seeing in the background there. So that's quite a fun way of trying to semi-automate some of the chaos. In process chaos engineering is what I think teams need to try and evolve to. So this is where, um, just as when um, we helped uh, achieve continuous delivery in many organizations, by thinking about quality and shifting quality to left and building quality into what we're doing. The same can be achieved, I think, with, with chaos engineering. But if, if each person on the team, not just the kind of DevOps engineers or, or platform engineers, uh, but the product owner, devs, QAs, business analysts, if they're all thinking about failure and what can happen. How should the system react to different failure modes throughout the whole of an, the engineering process? Then that will help improve uh, the way a system will, will perform production and prove its resilience. The fourth uh, top, uh, way of uh, using chaos uh, that we generally don't talk about that much is unplanned chaos. Uh, I'm sure people uh, kind of watching this talk, your systems are rock solid and they never fail, you never have production instance. Well, uh, production instance, unfortunately, are a fact of life for most of us. They can be viewed very negatively and it can cause a lot of stress, but I think it's really important that each time you have a production instance, you see it as an, an excellent opportunity uh, to learn. You can improve the way you, you learn from production instance by um, structuring uh, your team's reaction to them. And over time, uh, you can also use things called post instant reviews. Uh, there's various uh, templates and, and kind of uh, literature about how to run post instant reviews well. This is a growing field, by the way. Um, it's something that we as an IT industry uh, don't do very well yet. Um, so it's, it's still something we need to learn a lot more about. But if you have a, have a production instant, then getting everyone that uh, were involved in that instant together afterwards and, and just step through what happened. What did people observe? Um, how did they uh, know to dig into particular areas? Um, stepping through instance in that way is a really great way of, of learning more about the system that you're working with. And through, through learning about it, uh, that knowledge that engineers and, and product owners and, and QAs are gaining can really help Im improve the resilience of the overall system. There's various kind of ways of trying to automate um, how 
kind of, uh, incidents are managed and the data that's kind of captured through incidents. Um, there's all sorts of tools that are starting to emerge now in the, in the marketplace. Now, those tools are fantastic, but I'd encourage you that start simple and, and look at just simple ways that you can improve the way your teams uh, man, uh, respond to, to incidents. Uh, look at things like your communication channels. Um, how do people become aware of it in an instant? Um, and then how do people create a timeline and set through it afterwards? Chaos engineering isn't just about trying to build things that, that are kind of more elastic, build things that are more um, kind of resilient. I think it's primarily about um, education. It's, it's helping uh, us as an industry, us as a, as a group of, of engineers and um, product owners and testers to understand more about how our actual systems work. It's a bit like we're, we're a, kind of a medical team and we have this alien in the, in the operating room uh, that represents our system. And we haven't got a clue you know, what's wrong with it, or what happens when we um, you know, do something to it. And the, our IT system is so complex, they're like that. So Chaos helps us build up that knowledge and that of, of how our system behaves, what, what does normal look like for our systems and what happens when things go wrong. It also helps train people's behavior so that when problems do occur, they have more of a reflex action as to know, you know what to look at, who to talk to, and what steps they can take to remediate the problem. Next, Chaos Engineering can help with the process. It can um, ensure that, that teams have a much clearer set of steps to go through when an incident occurs. It also can improve the, um, the kind of the breadth and the depth of lessons we take from incidents by helping us do incident reviews well. Finally, it can improve our engineering process. So through using chaos engineering, we can start thinking more as we're uh, specifying a change and then um, specking it out and then actually doing the engineering on that change to, to think more about failure and think more about how we can make this change uh, more resilient and improve the overall resilience of our, of our system. Having addressed people and process, only then I think do we should we start thinking about how chaos engineering uh, can be applied to the product. Uh, but it can help in many ways. So chaos engineering can help us develop uh, systems that are simpler to reason about. If you have an overly complex system, then when an incident is happening, it makes it extremely difficult to work out you know, what, uh, what, what problem is triggering other problems when you're seeing different um, signals or different logs happening, what do they really mean? Chaos engineering can help you uh, improve the observability of the system by ensuring that you have the, the kind of the, the maximum signal to noise ratio. It can help with your documentation. So uh, if um, an incident happens and an engineer that's on call and responding is so, not so familiar, then they'd ideally want a run book that can really help guide them how to respond. So it can guide uh, we can improve how we uh, can write our runbooks and the kind of information we put in there okay we're now going to move on to um the mechanics of running a, a chaos state so firstly how do you decide um you know, when to run it and what are the steps you go through a bit of context uh, for the organization that uh, we've been running chaos days in it's a very large uh, public sector organization um has over 100 million customers the the organization uh, has grown significantly over time it's about six years old uh, so we started off with just two uh, two delivery teams uh, and they were building the platform as they went along we didn't design kind of this layout from day one it's how it's evolved uh, and as it grew uh, we've now reached about 60 teams uh, and those 60 teams are supported uh, by six platform teams that provide the underlying capabilities like um, building deployment services, um, observability, so logging and monitoring, alerting, um, auditing, persistence. Now, those are kind of the platform capabilities. It's a very, very uh, kind of busy platform as well in terms of the amount of requests that go through it. Uh, the numbers on the left-hand side uh, were from our busiest day last January. That was pre-COVID. Uh, so I think those, those numbers, you could probably double them now as uh, when we have uh, new services that uh, help large numbers of people in the United Kingdom um, have received benefits related to COVID. Um, we get a lot more traffic now. We chose a, a very constrained set of technologies when we started this platform, and that really helped uh, 
onboard new teams and uh, ensure that that teams could uh, land really quickly on the platform and develop services uh, very fast. Our focus when we started was on on getting the platform right for growth, right to, to optimizing it to get getting teams on and teams delivering public facing service really quickly. Uh, we were also thinking about resilience and and we kind of helped improve its resilience by going from one cloud provider, uh, which wasn't Amazon because Amazon wasn't available in the UK at that time, um, to to two pri uh, cloud providers, um, just to ensure that we had a kind of a, a spread of the cloud platforms that we we're working across. I wouldn't recommend doing this now, by the way. I, I think that uh, platforms such as um, AWS and GCP. Um, I don't have any experience with Azure because I can't comment on that. But certainly, I know from AWS and GCP that just using one of those cloud providers, their resilience is, is, is certainly high enough that uh, I'd be happy investing in just one of them as a cloud platform. But we didn't have that luxury, uh, so we chose to go multi-active. Now, through this period of time, we were having a lot of production incidents. Um, they, they were a, kind of a fact of life, and they made people that were called lives uh, fairly miserable. Uh, and because of that, we knew that we weren't ready to start doing chaos engineering because we had so many, like so much free chaos engineering in the form of uh, unplanned production instance. Then finally, AWS came along in the UK and we migrated to it. Um, we moved our entire platform across to AWS. We also uh, achieved quite a significant change in, in our process in that the organization uh, gave us permission to um, allow every team that works on a platform to deploy to any production, any environment, whenever they wanted. Uh, and this, this was quite a big achievement. It gave the platform teams, who at that point were doing all production deployments for all services, a lot more capacity, a spare capacity. So the combination of those two things made us think, okay, we're on AWS now, we've got, we know we've got a, a cloud infrastructure that is much more resilient than what we had previously. We have more capacity to think about how we can improve it and how we can measure our resilience. Let's do a chaos day. So that's that's kind of the timeline that uh, kind of took us to our first chaos day. So if you're wanting to run your own chaos day, kind of who do you involve, where do you run it, and, and how do you step through it? The approach I'd recommend is that um, the people that on the chaos day itself are actually going to be breaking things. We call them the agents of chaos, and we made that team a closed a kind of secret team. People knew who were in the team, but they didn't know what they were planning. Uh, and for our first chaos day, uh, we took one person from each of our six platform teams, and we asked the team to volunteer their most experienced person. So who's been on the platform the longest? Who is the person you always go to when there's a production incident? Because what we wanted to simulate through doing this is, is what we call the bus factor, or the highest person with the highest bus factor. Imagine that person had been hit by a bus and then your platform goes down. How are you going to cope? So for the chaos day itself, these people were unavailable to their teams. Um, so not only were they planning um, the uh, the experiments to run, so they, they had really good knowledge on how to kind of plan these things and, and what were the, the kind of key areas they wanted to explore, uh, they wouldn't go, they weren't going to be available um, to the team that was then responding. So having identified who these agents of chaos are. Uh, the next step is to kind of map out uh, the system that you're going to be experimenting on. Um, it's useful to gather around a whiteboard. And, and when you're doing this process, uh, you can involve the whole team. You don't need to constrain it to just the chaos, uh, the agents of chaos. Because at this point, we're just wanting to understand uh, kind of what types of things do we want to learn from this chaos state? What's a big list of possible experiments? Uh, we'll, we'll let the, the agents of chaos of pick the ones they're going to run with and, and design them in the way that's secret. Uh, but I think through having the whole team involved in, in looking at the, the kind of the system, mapping it out, understanding what normal looks like in terms of the behavior of your system, understanding what, um, what components do we not feel confident in, in uh, if they were to fail, um, and also what, what components do we have no control over. So, for instance, um, if an AWS availability zone went down, then 
you can't do much about that particular kind of problem, but you should hope that your uh, the way you've configured AWS should mean that your instances uh, can spread across multiple availability zones, so you would cope with that. So doing this in front of a whiteboard and, and just having lots of uh, kind of ideas about things that people are worried about uh, in terms of if they went wrong, they wouldn't know how to respond to uh, kind of is a helpful approach. And I found that as a facil uh, kind of facilitator for this session, that um, my job was to kind of to say as little as possible, apart from setting people the constraints, give them the clear goal, and then leave them to get on with it. Like happened with uh, Apollo 13, when the, the engineers had to get together and, and figure out how to deal with the uh, the problem of the um, air levels in the, in the Apollo 13 module. A bit of structure helps, and the structure I found useful to provide is a uh, this template, uh, we used um, Trello. Uh, so we had a template Trello card for each experiment or failure that we wanted to run. And the, the agents of chaos, um, once we had kind of brainstormed a big list of, 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 of failures, the agent of chaos then kind of did the detailed thinking on, okay, what are we actually simulating here? What's the, the, the real failure that, that we want to learn more about? Uh, what do we think will happen? So what's our hypothesis on how the system and the team will respond? And then what, how do we think uh, things are going to kind of automatically recover? Will, will there be any kind of self-healing that will happen? Or do we think an alert will fire and people will notice and, and uh, fix it somehow? How will the failure be rolled back? This is a hugely important uh, Thing to cover that we forgot about or didn't think about in our first chaos day and when we're running um, chaos experiments we, we found it useful to time box how long we run an experiment for so we'll introduce the failure give it maybe 20 minutes half an hour if the team haven't noticed we might give them a nudge um, if the team notice and then they're struggling we'll probably give them another half hour but it's quite demoralizing if you've got a production instant and you're just completely stuck. So generally to help get us through as many experiments as possible and get the kind of learning from a diverse range of experiments, we found it useful to have a rollback step, which we then invoke. So the agents of chaos would invoke if the team is really stuck. Um, so we just magically put everything back to normal and normal service res resumes. Because we're generally running uh, several different experiments in our chaos day, uh, you need to think about how these experiments uh, might interweave. Sometimes it's useful to have multiple experiments running at the same time, um, just to uh, simulate you know, what can really happen in production when multiple failures happen. Sometimes you'll want to uh, kind of serialize your experiments. So, so for instance, if you want to uh, explore what will happen if you took out all of your alerting or all of your, your monitoring, um, that's a useful experiment to do. But you don't want to do that and run lots of experiments, other experiments at the same time, because your your teams that are responding will be pretty blind without that kind of a monitoring um, and alerting stack. Uh, and so you're not going to get as much learning from doing those two things at the same time. Quite a different type of chaos uh, or experiment that you would also want to consider running on a chaos day is um, having uh, any kind of security engineers or security uh, people with interest in security on your team, try and run some security attacks uh, during your, your chaos day. This is a great opportunity. Um, whilst people are kind of busy trying to fight production instance, will they notice if someone uses that, uh, all of that, that chaos and that um, confusion, would they notice if someone was trying to then hack into the system or steal data or take someone's credentials? So if you've got people that can add uh, kind of some security experiments, then, then it's a good idea to have those as well. So having decided who, who's going to be doing it and what the experiments are, the next thing we need to consider is which environments are we going to run it on? And Netflix are quite famous for running their, their um, chaos experiments in production. And it, I really strongly emphasize it doesn't have to be production. You learn an awful lot from doing things in a pre-production environment. What I think is really important is that whichever environment you run it in is as close to production as possible so that you're learning um, you know, what would happen as if it were in production. And by close to production, I mean 
you need to be able to simulate traffic going through that environment in a way that you would see it in, in production. Uh, you need enough traffic so that when the failure occurs, it's going to have an impact, that the failure is going to then cause alerts to fire, for instance. That means you need production like alerting and telemetry and, and logging and monitoring. Uh, we're really fortunate that on this platform, we have cookie cutter environments that have the same um, you know, logging, alerting and monitoring uh, in, in each of the production and pre-production environments. We just need to tweak uh, for a chaos state, tweak the alert uh, thresholds um, so that if a kind of lower level of traffic caused a, a problem that an alert would fire. You also need to consider then, once you know which environment you're going to work on, what's the kind of blast radius? So for instance, if you've got um, other, other organizations that depend on your, your pre-production environments, wherever you're running your chaos, do you want them to be impacted by the chaos that you're running or do you want them protected? Uh, it's fine either way, just as long as if they're going to be affected, that they're aware of what you're doing. Finally, you all need to agree, how are we going to simulate a production incident happening from the perspective of communications? So what's a Slack channel or Teams channel? What, what way of, of communicating to, to the people that use that environment and the people that are coordinating our response to an incident? What way are we going to um, you know, have these discussions? Again, you want this to be as close to what you do in production as possible. I'll show you an example of that in a second. OK, so you know who's going to do it, you know what they're going to do, you know where they're going to do it. You need to then think about the actual execution of it. Each time we run a chaos day, we, we, we ask ourselves, is it useful to give people warning or not? That this is going to happen. Um, we've also moved from, from having just one chaos day to actually running a week of chaos. Um, and this allows us to, to kind of do a balance. So we, we found that useful, effectively respectable, to, to warn people that use our platform that we are running a chaos day. Uh, but we've increased the element of surprise by, by changing it to a chaos week. Uh, so we give people notice that in this week, Things might go wrong. Just be prepared for that. So don't plan any super critical work to happen in that week because uh, you may be delayed. It's important when you're picking these dates to know if there are any you know, key uh, organizational events uh, or, or deliveries that need to be done uh, or that will use that platform or that environment in, in that period because you probably want to avoid those because uh, chaos days can be quite disruptive. It's important that you agree when you're going to stop wreaking havoc. Uh, when we did our first chaos day, uh, I think it took us two days after the chaos day to put the environment back together. Uh, following that, we all agreed, OK, we'll stop wreaking havoc at about half past three, half past four in the afternoon, and then we'll ensure everything's been rolled back. Uh, people are much happier if you do that. Then the agents of chaos, uh, they need their own private way of communicating. So if you can't co-locate them, which is pretty difficult these days, uh, then ensure they've got a private um, Slack or Teams channel. Ensure they have a Trello board with those cards that are prioritized in terms of the experiments they're going to run so uh, they can see okay, who's running which experiment, uh, are people responding to it, or um, do we need to roll it back? It helps to have someone to facilitate this. Um, to, just so that uh, the, the team don't get obsessed with just one experiment, uh, run it for too long, so, so they can actually move across several experiments. Super important um, that you, you can self-document what you're doing. And we find this is really useful to do using a mixture of, of putting comments in the Trello card and also uh, using <clears throat> threads in, in something like Slack. So each time you're running an experiment, uh, put into, into Slack you know, that we've started this and then make comments about what you're seeing. Documenting uh, kind of chaos in this way makes it super easy uh, to kind of get really valuable lessons as you then later on go back and review what's happened because you can Slack in effect is creating a, a kind of an automatic timeline for you, for you about what happened when. <clears throat> for everyone else that is uh, working on the platform that's going to be impacted by the chaos, it's very very important that they work like it's just another ordinary day at the office or ordinary day working from home. Uh, they should be busy doing whatever they normally do because you don't know when a production incident is going to happen, do you? They come when you least expect them. They come when you're busy doing other things. And that's what should people should be on, on the chaos day. 
However, when something does go wrong, if it's in a pre-production environment, then they need to treat it as though it was production that was on fire itself. In terms of communication channels, on our platform, we have a public event, then environment, then issues. So we have an event staging issues, event QA issues, and for our production environment, we have event and the live issues. And we agreed that if we were going to use staging, then we would use the event staging issues as the, the public uh, communication channel where the, the platform teams that are responding to the, the, the production incident or the pretend production incident would be communicating to the rest of the platform. They then followed their own processes using other channels to kind of communicate on the details of, of their response. Now, having run the chaos, uh, which gives you loads of learning, by the way, just actually kind of stepping through that day, um, people learn a lot about how their systems work. Um, we then need to kind of dig in a bit more and um, try and draw out more lessons and, and, and share those lessons more widely. How do we do that? Um, when you're running kind of chaos days on large platforms, uh, we typically had all, well, probably six plus teams. Sometimes we had about 10 teams involved in chaos day. Um, getting like 10 teams of 10 together to try and do a retrospective is really difficult. So what I'd recommend um, that you divide up your, your retrospectives or your post since reviews um, into your component teams. So uh, each team asks them to go away and run a post incident review or a retro about the chaos day. So treat it for each, each failure that they were dealing with as a real post incident review and step through that process. That's a way of improving that process itself. They should be focusing uh, primarily on kind of what lessons about resilience can we draw out uh, from the chaos day. So you know, what can we use to improve how people kind of understand resilience, what can improve about our process, and then finally what can improve about the product. They should then secondly consider the actual mechanics of the chaos day itself, because uh, it's a good idea to run these things regularly. So what would we do differently to try and make the next one even better, to try and improve the lessons that we get from the next one? Having had each team do that themselves, uh, then regroup, bring, bring someone from each of those teams uh, into a team of teams retro where they can put forward the key uh, lessons that they got from their own retros. Have this all documented as well and shared across the organization as wise as you can. There's, uh, there, there's so much um, good information from these uh, post-incident reviews and retrospectives that um, it's important to distribute it so other engineers that didn't participate uh, can learn from it. Having done this uh, quite a few times now and in a few different organizations, uh, we've learned that if you're the first time you're doing a chaos day, start small. Start with just one team and a few services because there's a lot you learn about doing chaos days themselves um, through doing this. If you try and scale up to like, multiple teams on your first day, it can create a lot of pain that isn't very helpful. Uh, I'm talking about pain. Don't break too much on your first chaos day or even on subsequent ones. You want to run maybe between five and 10 experiments. Now, that's enough to get a, a whole load of learnings because that's a bit like five or 10 production incidents happening all on the same day. You don't need to use a production environment. You can just use something that is close to it as possible. That should help you, I think, consider you know, how production-like are our pre-production environments, because uh, it's really, really important that they are production-like. Um, so if they're not production-like, then you've probably got a bunch of engineering you just need to do on that. It can be very tempting uh, when you're running through chaos days to, to try and come up with a big list of, of improvements. You know, these, these are all the kind of new alerts we need to put in. These are the run book, the dashboards. We need to put circuit breakers here and this there. Uh, and while some of those, those improvements can be useful, hold back on coming up with that list. Focus first on what lessons can we draw out about our system about resilience uh, from this chaos day. And as we're going through those lessons, you're doing the retrospective, note down somewhere separate you know, what are the things that we might consider about, you know, uh, improvements to our product uh, for this? Then later, a few days later, go away and review that list because you don't want to have knee-jerk reactions of, of, of you know, circuit breakers and alerts that you're going to put in because uh, the chances are uh, the alerts you put in, they may never fire again because of the like, special nature of some of the experiments you put in. Finally, they can be a lot of fun. So use the chaos day as a way to, to help people that perhaps don't normally work together um, can learn more about each other and, and enjoy uh, being in control of your own chaos. 
So hopefully having listened to this, uh, there's some things that, that you might want to take away to your organization. So I'd encourage you to, to think about how, how established are your systems that you're working on? Are they ready for applying some kind of chaos engineering? What's this, the smallest thing you could do to um, improve your, your system's resilience? Uh, this is something that uh, we have to help other organizations out with us. So feel free to get in touch. Uh, there'll be links in the slides that I'll share after this session. We've also taken the things we've learned from running uh, chaos days and put them into publicly uh, available open source playbooks, um, not just on chaos days, but also on things like secure delivery and working remotely. And I'll share links to those uh, also. Right. OK, thank you so much for listening. And we can now move on to some questions. Uh, so the first question is from Sambhavi. It's what has changed in chaos engineering practices over the years? Could you share a bit more about where we are in the maturity of this practice? Certainly. OK. Um, I, th I think chaos engineering is uh, currently a bit like where continuous delivery was um, well, maybe 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And um, I remember seeing a, a talk by John Orspor, um, who kind of helped introduce uh, continuous delivery at, at Netflix. And he did a, um, a presentation about it. Um, at a Q, uh, no, an O'Reilly conference about 10 years ago. And, and after talking about, you know, why continuous delivery was a, a useful thing to do, some people came up to him and said, you know, you're, you're irresponsible trying to encourage organizations to deliver in this way. Uh, and I think the same kind of response can be made to chaos engineering. If some people, when you're telling them, you should try and break things in, the, in, in your pre-production or even your production environment and see what happens, people might think that's irresponsible. That was probably a few years ago. I think now people are realizing actually, you know, failure is such a certainty that it is useful um, to be, be can deliberately invoking failure. And our systems are so complex now that deliberately invoking failure is the only way uh, we're going to be learning about kind of how our systems respond. And so I think we, we now recognize that, that this is a useful thing to do. And um, there is increasing kind of tool support um, in terms of particularly things that work with different clouds for uh, automating uh, kind of chaos. Um, it's not as an established engineering kind of practice as, say, tester and development or, or pair programming. So it's it's not something that I think, you know, many teams have at the very start of their process yet. So I, th I think we're probably another 10 years off that. Does that, uh, I hope that answers your question uh, enough. Should we move on to the next one? Uh, yep. Do you the measure the cost of, of running chaos days? Um, well, we don't, we don't measure and report on it, uh, no. So we, we know how much it costs in terms of uh, how many people are involved. Because um, in terms of the cost, it's the... The, engine, the agents of chaos, uh, their, their time kind of uh, planning things and then actually running the experiments. For the rest of the teams, though, bear in mind that we're encouraging them to work as a normal working day. So if things, if your organization is set up really, really, really well, then most of the team will be unaffected. They'll just be whoever's on support for that day having to deal with things. Um, but if you're trying to break things big style and uh, your team is poorly set up to handle these failures, then often the whole team might get involved. Uh, we, we don't find any kind of benefit in measuring the cost in kind of actually engineering time and reporting on it because we, I think we, we've kind of asked ourselves a question or you can ask the organization a question. What would you rather do? Would you rather you know, spend time putting in controlled chaos and learning about how to respond to it? Or would you rather wait for a, like a, a critical business event, a key business event to happen and for things to go wrong at that point. Because there's the, the cost that you're incurring there when it's a key business event that, that takes your platform out is the reputational kind of risk and the reputational cost. And that is kind of orders of magnitude more than engineering costs. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think measuring the cost of chaos days is such a helpful thing to do because the, the benefits to me are very clear. The next question was, does the Pareto principle work in chaos testing as well? Uh, Pareto, is that the 80-20 rule? 
So when um, the team is starting off to brainstorm, okay, what are the kind of experiments that they want to kind of run? Uh, typically, we get the whole team involved in, in doing this because through getting the whole team involved, then they learn more about the system. Um, you know, people will be saying, well, I know that when this component fails, it will kind of, uh, kind of ripple out in this kind of way. And another engineer may not have known that. Or one engineer might say, well, I'm really worried about what will happen if this component fails. I don't, I don't I can't predict what will happen. Um, and there might be another person that has the answer to that. So I think when we run this, we typically get 20 to 30 possible experiments that we want to run. And I encourage people to try and kind of prioritize things by, you know, risk stroke worry. What are the things that, that if they happen tomorrow in production on your busiest day, would you be most worried about? And we, we go for those. Uh, and you get a lot of learning kind of, I think sometimes regardless of which particular experiments, because if a production incident happens and that some things are common across all production incidents, such as um, how your engineers uh, diagnose the problem, what kind of alerting and logging do they get from it? Um, how do they communicate? Those kind of things transcend different experiments. I think just by choosing a small number, say between five and 10 of experiments, um, then you will kind of learn, you know, learn a lot. And by prioritizing by, by kind of risk through worry, uh, that, that's very effective. You don't have to cover massive amounts of ground.